everyone. Thank you for taking time off, especially at night after a council meeting. This is tr a tradition we do every two years as a way of um, primarily building relationships, starting to build relationships and ensuring that we get off on the right foot. Certainly ever since each of you first considered running, your thoughts have clearly been focused on all the documents necessary uh, to satisfy the county recorder and clerk and all, all the financial reporting, lots of things to think about, running your campaign. But tonight you get to put all that aside. Tonight is something totally different. Our focus tonight is on governing, on the services that each of the departments and their teams provide and on who we are. Um, and, and, and that's not a trivial thing to think about because the substance of what we do and the processes by which we do them in government are very foreign to most people who aren't involved in local government. Uh, we're very complex for a small organization. We do a ton of things that one wouldn't expect with an organization so small. And second, the processes that we have to use to make decisions, to take public input, to ensure public accountability and trust, um, and to ensure transparency can be very challenging, very confusing at the beginning. So it's, it's a whole new set of substance and a whole new set of processes that we ask you to get up to speed on very quickly as candidates. So we really want to just take some time tonight and develop relationships. So tonight you'll be having a chance to meet each and every one of the department heads. Um, and in addition to our line department heads, and we'll show you in our org chart in a little while, we also have Sarah Johnson Rios here, our assistant city manager, and Kimberly Hood, our city attorney. And so these are the people that in general you'll be dealing with. Now, obviously we have division heads and program managers and others, but we, we really ask for all of our elected officials as well as appointed officials like uh, planning commissioners to really just deal with department heads. And there's a reason for that. The department heads have a much broader perspective on issues related to their departments to be able to answer well the questions you ask. But in addition, People who aren't department heads, nothing against them. Sometimes when a council member or council candidate asks a question, that's stressful. They don't they don't deal with council members and council candidates or tr city treasurer on a regular basis. And so it just becomes an awkward situation and you might not get the best information. So we'd like to tonight spend some time building relationship, helping inform you about some of the things we're doing um, and also we'll give you tomorrow a contact list and contact information for all the people who are making presentations tonight. So if you have follow-up questions, if you have tours you'd like to take, um, there will be, a, they will be expecting your call. And before I forget, even though this is slightly out of sequence, um, Jacob as the only one who's not a current part of the city organization. I hope you've been getting all of the agenda packets and other documents that uh, go to council members. If you're not, um, well, how would you know? It's something that sounds silly to me, but if you're not getting what you think, everything you should be, please let us know because, or please let me know. Our, our general rule is once a candidate has been qualified, everything that goes to a, a seated council member also goes to the candidates. So you have the same um, base of information. So, uh, Dave, if you would, next slide, please. Okay, a little bit about governance. Um, governance is surprisingly fragile. Uh, most Americans 10, 20, 30 years ago uh, would not have thought that. Problems in governance were problems that the other guys faced uh, in other countries, in third world countries, et cetera, et cetera. But maybe more recently we started to understand that we have benefited in general, not that we don't have our issues, but we benefit in general as a nation, as a state, and as a city from a very high level of governance. And it's something that is an ongoing task for all of us and in, and certainly council members and city treasurers to be mindful of that and ensure the people that follow you also have an understanding of government and can sustain that high level of governments, governance. And the role clearly is one to create an environment that promotes trust and involvement 
and encourages volunteers, encourages residents to volunteer for boards and commissions and for running for council in the future. Uh, many a good council in many cities have been have been followed by a bad council because the community did, community did not groom uh, replacement. So we're governed by what's called the council manager form. It's about 110 years old. Uh, there are other forms, some of which you're probably familiar with. One is the strong mayor form, and that tends to be used by large cities like Los Angeles, New York, and others. Um, and those cities also tend to have um, party affiliation to be elected as the mayor. We are apolitical, as you know, obviously, uh, but also in the council manager form, um, the council is the, the policymaking body. That's its primary function, but also it has some specific duties. For instance, it adopts the budget, it uh, places measures on the ballot, it hears appeals of land of planning decisions, planning commission decisions. But in general, the council makes policy. The role of the city manager and staff is uh, twofold: one to recommend policies to the council, and two to implement the council's decisions. And that sounds all very simple, but it certainly is in the actual operation is by no means simple. And the lines frequently get blurred and there can be positive blurring in those lines and there can be negative blurring in the, of those lines. But um, we, we all find our own accommodations to working in a system that that tries to do the best thing for the public. We also in California and local government have this truly bizarre mix of representative democracy and direct democracy. It's very quirky. Hiram Johnson and the progressives in the 1920s were responsible for a lot, for a lot of it. Um, and if you think about it, the United States is really a republic, it's not a democracy, the state of California, it's the Republic of California, the California Republic. And a republic really is designed to have organizational features and checks and balances that really put a limit on democracy. The, the generators of the Republic form really felt that um, democracy too often turned to mob rule and other um, dysfunctional aspects. So it was an attempt to put a break on that. And so a lot of our systems are designed to ensure a small group of hopefully well-informed people make decisions. But then there's such things as initiatives and referenda and other things that have been kind of uh, glommed onto the overall system that are truly um, more characteristic of direct democracy. In addition, council members are stuck in this position first identified by Edmund Burke in the 18th century of being both what are called trustees and delegates. So in one sense, you're a delegate, you're elected um, either a council member or a treasurer is ele elected uh, by the people supposedly to do what the people want. But as Edmund Burke said, if you if you sacrifice your own conscience to what the people are telling you, you you're not doing the community any service. And so you're also a trustee. It's also your role to do based on your involvement, your much greater knowledge in the issues, your, your responsibility, the fact that you can sit at the council dais well, the non-COVID times sit at the council dais and debate issues to come up with better solutions, um, even if you believe that a majority of the public doesn't agree with that. If you think that is what's best for the community in the long run, um, that is what you are tasked to do. But of course, you also have to think about re-election if you want to be re-elected, and, and the public's not going to re-elect it if they think you're not doing what they want you to do. So it's this very difficult balancing act of being both a trustee and a delegate. Uh, community engagement is a huge issue right now. Local government is the most trusted level of government in the United States. It has been for um, a generation or more, but we're also victimized by low voting rates, relatively low trust, um, much lower levels of understanding information. The public is so busy with their own lives. Um, it is very difficult to help inform them and ensure they have an informed view. and in many cases, they don't truly understand what local government does. I mean, they have a huge advantage in that they see you in the grocery store and at the gas pump, and they can yell across the parking lot at you and come up to you at any time and talk to you about what they consider important. And that's such a vital component of local government. 
but most of our public really doesn't understand that or potentially even care. And then finally, one final point I wanted to make about the council is that it's small group legislative decision making. And that is so crucial because with a population of 32,000, a council of five or maybe slightly larger um, can very effectively represent almost all the major perspectives in the community and bring all those perspectives to a body that can sit and talk and deliberate o over an issue. And the research is very clear. Once you get a group larger than nine or 10 or 11, that kind of deliberation and truly being able to change each other's minds and enrich each other's minds and come up with a solution that combines the perspectives of every um, involved member is almost impossible. But a council of five that brings those different respect, uh, perspectives and respects each other um, can come up with amazing policies that serve the majority of the community for the long term. And one of the hallmarks of this city is council members that work well together. There are other cities where it's like armed camps that every vote's it's kind of like the Supreme Court. Every vote is a 3-2 or a 5-4, whatever the case may be, not in Paso Robles. It's a wonderful example of a council that truly takes advantage of, of the possibilities of small group legislative decision making. And then finally, just uh, although you won't find it in any book, they're really through history started um, uh, shortly after the glorious revolution in England. But it's generally believed that representatives such as council members have three primary duties. The first is the duty of care, and that's putting in enough time and energy to come up with a position on issue and decisions that are based on information. The second is the duty of loyalty, and that's putting the community's interest ahead of one's own. And that's hugely important that, um, as Madison said in um, Federalist Paper 51, no man should be judge of, of his own matters. And that's what we ask council members to do, is set their own matters aside and make decisions on behalf of the community as a whole. And then the duty of good faith, um, the obligation of all of us, not just council members, but all of us to act with honesty and with sincerity of intention. So really, that's what I'd like to share just as an introduction. And then I believe Warren's going to share a little bit about the Community Development Department. Oh, thank you. Um, so just the basic structure, the people of Pass Robles on top, obviously, uh, we used to have an elected city clerk. We no longer have an elected city clerk. The, the position got way too technical uh, for elected city clerk in general to be able to do it effectively. And so there really is just the city council and the city treasurer as the elected officials. Then the city council has three general reporting bodies. The city manager, who's the CEO and who hires and supervises all staff. The city attorney, we have a contract city attorney, Kimberly Hood, who's on the line with BBK. And then all of the advisory bodies that you appoint as council and that you also um, approve their bylaws and in general um, ask them to take undertake certain functions on your behalf and give you advice or you sometimes delegate decision making authority to them. OK, thanks, Dave. Next slide. So Warren, please take it away. Yes, yes. good evening. Warren Frace, uh, the Community uh, Development Director, director. here. And uh, let's see, I got an echo there. Let me turn down my mic here. OK, so Warren Frace, Community Development Director, um, so I'm a longtime resident of Paso Robles. I've been here since 1999. I graduated uh, from Cal Poly in the city and regional planning department. 
I've been with the city um, working as the community development director for about five or six years now. So the community development department is divided into three functions. There's the building function, planning function, and engineering function. So if you go to the next slide, Dave. So uh, building division is run by Brian Cowan. He's our chief building official. Our city planner is uh, Darren Nash. And then the city engineer is Dave Athey. And they oversee everything from the beginning of projects, which we typically refer to as kind of planning entitlements, through the subdivision process and putting in the public improvements and then the actual construction of the houses. So that whole process um, is overseen by community development in con uh, close collaboration with all the other city departments that have a, a big stake in how projects move ahead as well. Next slide. So you can kind of see how the process typically works. Most things start in the planning department as a planning entitlement. Um, then they move on to the city engineer, the grading, the drainage type issues, the subdivision maps, those sorts of things are handled by the city engineer. And then finally, the construction process, the uh, structures, the houses, the stores, that sort of thing um, is in the building process. But it's a kind of a seamless process. All the depart or divisions work very closely together to make that happen. Next slide. So in terms of some of the key things that our department's in charge of that you'll hear about um, is the general plan. So the uh, city staff supports the planning commission. The planning commission advises the city council on the general plan. Um, we make periodic updates to it so it meets with the community needs and standards. Um, we have also the housing element, which we're in the process of updating right now. Um, that lays out our long-term housing needs, both uh, affordable housing as well as market rate housing. There's the zoning ordinance. Um, that's part of the municipal code. Um, staff plus the planning commission will make periodic recommendations to the city council for changes because that's a legal um, ordinance. The city council always has the final say on making those changes. The building permit and inspection process is something that Brian Cowan, the chief building official, oversees with his staff. Um, the city engineer is in charge of the engineering standards for roads, uh, underground utilities, um, that sort of thing. Stormwater management's a new issue that's become uh, more important. This is a mandate from the federal and state levels of government. So the city engineer is in charge of making sure all our projects comply with those requirements. Um, oak tree protection, obviously, for the city of Paso Robles is a big issue. Uh, so the planning department oversees that ordinance and will bring uh, decisions on tree removals to both planning commission and city council. And then we also deal with what we call CEQA, which is the California Environmental Quality Act. That's the environmental review process for projects. That can be anything from kind of minor, uh, what we call statutory reviews up to those uh, large documents, those EIR processes. So we handle all those within our department. So next slide. So we have a staff of 14 employees um, representing the three divisions. They're all um, you know, really talented and really devoted to the city and really have a high focus on customer service. So they take pride in moving projects quickly and efficiently through the process and delivering uh, high quality service, um, not only to the public, but uh, those applicants seeking permits. Um, everybody um, is local residents, basically living in the North County, and really have a, a devotion to enhancing the quality of life in the community. Um, economic development is another thing that we deal with. Obviously, construction of uh, houses, stores um, is in key to jobs and um, just the economic quality of life. Public health and safety obviously is a concern and then public outreach and transparency we try to make sure all our processes involve the public um, and have plenty of opportunity for the public to participate and then one thing to keep in mind is we charge permit fees for all these processes 
So although we aren't an actual enterprise fund, we do uh, recapture the majority of our staff costs in these fees. So basically the applicants in these big projects, they pay for the staff that does the processing. And the next slide. So some of the big projects um, we've been working on recently, the Olson South Chandler specific plan that was approved by the city council in February, 1,223 new houses ranging from apartments to new single family homes, uh, the gateway annexation, as well as the 46 West improvements on 101. Uh, that was recently approved by the city council as well. That's gonna be going on to LAFCO. Uh, for annexation to the city. So that's another process that we deal with. The Beechwood specific plan, which is a 911 unit mixed of uses. Um, that project is scheduled for the city council to hear in October. As I mentioned, the housing elements in process. And then we have a plan we call the Uptown Town Center specific plan that covers the downtown zone. Um, that basically has allowed all the development you see in the downtown around the park, the mixed use development, and then the infill residential around town. Next slide. Lauren. Yeah. Yeah. Before you go on, uh, I don't know uh, uh, how much uh, our, our other candidate knows about this. Uh, Mr. Allred, like you you said LAFCO. Would you tell him what LAFCO stands for, please? Yeah, LAFCO is a county board. It's the local area formation commission. So anytime a city um, basically reorganizes its boundaries in terms of expanding its area that it's in charge of, um, that's required to be considered by LAFCO. So those board members are appointed by the county board of supervisors and represent all the agencies within the um, county and they make the final decision on those changes. So Fred, thanks for asking the question and, and please any of the candidates, if you have a question, just jump right in and ask rather than waiting till the end. Yes, definitely. So as I mentioned, economic developments, uh, a key focus of our department, we're very involved with tourism and hotel development. So you've seen a number of hotels approved over the last couple of years. There's probably another half dozen that are in what we call the pipeline where they're going through the approval process. Depending on economics uh, will affect how fast those move forward. We worked on projects like the Sensario Garden of Lights project, um, the expansion of the uh, Firestone Walker Brewery. We also deal with circulation. We work very closely with Caltrans on addressing circulation issues, both within the city as well as on the state highways. It's a lot of issues with Highway 46, especially the eastbound to the Central Valley that we're working on right now. And then the COVID-19 recovery process we've also been involved in. And I think that brings us to the last slide. So I think that kind of wraps it up for community development. Once again, it's three divisions, building, planning, and city engineer. So uh, move on now to community services if there's no questions. No, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Warren. Good evening, um, candidates. So in keeping with this theme of who we are and what we do, I am Julie Dolan, the Director of Community Services. And I thank you for taking time out of your busy campaign to learn more about city operations. I have worked for the city of Paso Robles for over 25 years and I am still learning. In fact, education is my passion. I started my working life as a fifth grade teacher and then I worked for several years as a substitute teacher in Paso Robles while my children were babies. It was a wonderful way to connect with the youth of all ages in our community. But I jumped at the chance to be hired for a part-time position at the Paso Robles City Library back in 1995 when the new City Hall Library facility was complete. Working in an environment of lifelong learning with readers of all ages was where I was meant to be. In 1998, I was hired as the children's librarian, perfectly combining literacy, working with children and the library into my dream job. Eventually I advanced to city librarian and then director of library and recreation services. 
In 2016, my department was reinvented, adding parks and facilities to library and recreation, and really creating a great synergy as we work together to maintain the very parks and buildings that support our library and recreation activities. Referred to as the dream team, at least by me, we are led by city librarian Angelica Fortin, recreation services manager Linda Plesha, and maintenance superintendent Frida Berman. Frida also manages many capital projects and major community events for the city. Next slide, please. Although it is frequently indicated that community services ranks high in its portion of the city's $46 million general fund budget, a breakdown by division is much more revealing. Our maintenance division down in the lower corner there holds the lion's share of our budget at about $4.9 million. The library comes in at only $1.25 million and recreation's net portion of the budget hovers at about $750,000. Clearly, we are a lean, mean dream team. Slide number three, please. I can find my notes. And we still get a lot done. Our seven parks employees are responsible for maintaining some 15,000 trees caring for over 120 acres of parks, trails, and open space, supporting special events such as the Wine Festival, and overseeing 170 acres of landscape and lighting district properties. While we contract out the day-to-day -day maintenance of the LLD areas, assuring quality control and contract adherence is very time consuming. Park staff also assists with event support. Our five facilities maintenance employees take care of Centennial and Municipal Pool Complexes and all city buildings, totaling approximately 180,000 square feet. Maintenance staff also support special projects for the city, such as setting up outdoor dining in the downtown, and adopting COVID-19 sanitation and building protocols during the pandemic. Next slide, please. Our city library is open 57 hours per week, Monday through Saturday, supported by an FTE of 10, including three master's degree librarians. The library offers a full array of materials for checkout, online databases accessible from home and programming for all ages. We have achieved our entire five-year library strategic plan in just three years, most notably raising the technology bar in the library by incorporating RFID into the collection. Every item is tagged with an RFID code that provides security against theft and makes check-in and check-out much more efficient. The $60,000 investment was supported entirely by our library foundation and our partnership with the Black Gold Library Cooperative. Julie, the library, real quick, sure. Real, real quick, as you're telling us this, like you use some abbreviations, RTIF and uh, uh, FTI or FTE. Would you explain what those in? Jacob might not understand. Full time equivalent and RFID is uh, radio frequency identifiers, I believe. I'm familiar with those terms. Very good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Yes, Jacob has the benefit of serving on our Library Board of Trustees. So apologies if I skip through that quickly, but appreciate that you know that. Also, the library offers Wi Fi hotspots for checkout free Wi-Fi in the building and now in the parking lot, adapting to early pandemic restrictions. Next slide, please. Another huge source of pride for library staff and the city is our library study center. Established in 2001, it was originally a fun spot for children to work on homework and was located inside of the Paso Robles Youth Arts Building on Spring Street. When the study center relocated to its current location adjacent to the Uptown Family Park and across the street from Georgia Brown School, several internet computers were added, as well as an in-house collection of books and audio materials. 
with enormous support from the Paso Robles Library Foundation and Friends of the Library, the Library Study Center is now a fully functioning branch library. People can actually get a library card there and check out materials just as they do in the main library. And of course, this is a huge benefit to families on the north end of Paso Robles who can now walk to a neighborhood library. During the pandemic, we also extended Wi-Fi outdoors at the study center, and we are preparing to initiate grab and go service at the center as we currently have in the library by next month. Next slide, please. With a full-time equivalency of seven and a seasonal aquatic staff, our recreation division provides high quality programming. 45 contract classes are currently offered from art to Zumba. Staff coordinates the use of seven major parks featuring sports fields, playgrounds, tennis, pickleball, and basketball courts, and barbecue pavilions. Recreation Services also oversees the contracts to provide administrative services at the Senior Center, youth programs at Centennial Park, and concession services at Barney Schwartz Park. Our seasonal aquatics program at Centennial and Municipal Pools includes 700 swim lessons annually, as well as daily public swim. We collaborate with the Paso Robles School District in making pools available for their swim units for middle schoolers, and Municipal Pool is crucial to high school athletic programs, including diving and water polo. Recreation has also played a key role in emergency operations during the pandemic and the recent fire, developing campaigns to assure community safety. Recreation manager Linda Plesha is currently serving as the EOC's shelter and welfare branch manager in addition to her regular duties. She was responsible for setting up and staffing an evacuation center during the fire in June and a cooling center in August. Next slide, please. The Community Services Department bravely faces a myriad of issues as we continue to reinvent ourselves. Our role in coordinating homeless services is currently under construction, so pardon our dust. I am working to enhance collaboration among such groups as Paso Cares, ECHO, and the Police Department's Community Action Team. Although we have had some hiccups along the way, our city recognizes the call to improve the quality of life for all who live here, including people experiencing homelessness. I have never been more gratified by and proud of my department's efforts as I have during the pandemic. Almost overnight, our highly skilled, creative staff pivoted to a virtual platform to support our residents. They have consistently led the curve in interpreting the latest reopening guidelines to provide curbside and grab and go service in the library, outdoor recreation and fitness classes, and outreach to our most vulnerable populations. And you can see the images on the screen. The first one there is the Sherwood Park Area Master Plan. And prior to the pandemic, plans were underway to implement this plan including new pickleball courts and a skate park. The other image is a design a concept drawing of library expansion. The library had gained city council endorsement for a facilities master plan intended to increase library service for a growing community. Through participation in the Olson South Chandler and Beachwood specific planning process, we have advocated for the provision of additional playing fields and other recreational amenities to serve the new residents expected to purchase homes here. Community services staff remains optimistic that we will be able to continue to thrive as a department. And we recognize that Paso Robles will need our services post pandemic more than ever, restoring the quality of life a suffering community sorely needs. And that's my presentation. Thank you. Passing along to, is it 
Christopher in Public Works. There we go. Hello, my name is Christopher Leckel. I am the Interim Public Works Director for the city. I'm a Cal Poly graduate um, with a background in engineering and business. I'm a licensed civil engineer in California. From 2000 to 2007, while working for a local engineering firm, I was contracted by the city to design reservoirs, sewer lift stations, pipelines, water mains, wells, arsenic removal systems, seismic retrofits and repairs following the San Simeon earthquake. I was responsible for developing the city's first GIS water atlas and computerized water model. I prepared the city's water master plan, long-term water resource plan, and initial, and an initial recycled water plan. Given how much work I was performing for the city, we decided to make it permanent in early 2008 when I became the city's water resources manager. I've served the city in that position until just a few weeks ago when I assumed my current role. And go to the next slide, please. The public works department is budgeted for 55 full-time staff members. Our scope of duties includes, um, duties and services include streets, airport, wastewater, fleet maintenance, solid waste, capital projects, potable water, and stormwater. As you can see, the majority of public works staff are dedicated to providing water and wastewater services to our community. Next, next slide, please. Each of our major divisions are managed by dedicated specialists. Bob Solway supervises our city fleet maintenance group. Kirk Gonzalez, licensed engineer, manages our potable water division. Matt Thompson, licensed engineer, manages our wastewater division. Didis Esperanza, licensed engineer, manages and oversees the vast majority of the city's infrastructure improvement projects. And Roger Oxborough manages the city airport. Solid waste is managed by an outside contractor. Next slide, please. Real quick, what are those red? It's really hard to read. The red uh, text on there, was that vacant? vacant? Yeah, those are vacant slots. So we have budgeted a, uh, for a total of 55 positions, but not all of them are currently filled. Are those some of the ones that are, um, I guess, frozen, for lack of a better term, right now? Um, not not on the utility side. There, there's it. one there on the street side, which goes as part of the general fund. So that one is frozen for that purpose. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Next slide. And actually, Christopher, you might want to explain when you were saying that. Uh, I, again, I don't know if J Jacob knows which ones of those departments are actually under the general fund and which ones are are separate uh, enterprise funds. Yeah, I wasn't going to get into that, but I can if 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 I if you're asking me to. Can we go back one slide? So the there's something that we refer to as the enterprise funds. Um, enterprise funds are are um, services that the city provides that are funded through service fees. For example, your water bill. Um, the, the, the water fund is funded entirely by, um, by billing customers for the service that it provides. Same for wastewater. So that's why those are often looked at separately from the general fund. The, the money is generated in the enterprise fund um, can't be used for general fund services, for example. Um, we can't use them to fund police officers or to pave roads. They have to be used for um, the for water service itself or wastewater service. Next slide. Most of the services that Public Works provides are ubiquitous and often overlooked. That is until there is some disruption. Disruptions in service services that we provide can have can have significant consequences to the quality of life, health, and safety of our residents. Our goal is to be taken for granted. The community can assume and expect that we are working to ensure safe and reliable services 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Next slide, please. Capital projects engineering. There's currently a great deal of investment being made um, in infrastructure maintenance, enhancement and expansion. This slide provides a list of significant efforts currently underway in the water and wastewater utilities. This includes recoding of the, the 4 million gallon steel tanks, known as our Golden Hills tanks, that serve as the primary water storage for the east side of the city. Also includes the demolition and reconstruction of a nearly 100 year old 4 million gallon reservoir 
um, that provides potable water service for the west side of the city and various other um, water and wastewater improvements needed to expand or improve existing service. Next slide. Capital projects engineering is focused on streets with a city maintained pavement network of, of over 33 million square feet. A combination of the 2012 supplemental sales tax and gas tax provides an annual average budget of about $5 million. These funds have allowed work on one quarter of the overall network to date. Uh, that's since 2012. However, streets continue to, to deteriorate faster than current funding levels can address. Um, it would require an average of $10 million of paving projects year yearly to prevent the city's current overall pavement condition from deteriorating further. However, notable projects have been completed, and those projects include the reconstruction of Union Road um, by Barney Schwartz Park, uh, rehabilitation of Spring Street from 1st to 34th, maintenance of Creston Road, South Vine, and 185 residential neighborhood roads. And projects currently underway or in design are listed here on this slide. Next slide, please. Wastewater. This is an aerial view of the city's wastewater facility while it was undergoing uh, some major upgrades. The wastewater division owns and operates 126 miles of sewer, 14 list stations to collect and convey wastewater throughout the city to the treatment plant located at the north end of town. In 2016, the city completed the major upgrades of its overall wastewater treatment plant. In 2019, the city completed construction and began operating the new tertiary treatment facility capable, capable of producing high quality recycled water. Wastewater recently adopted a new water master plan in 2019 that identifies existing deficiencies and improvements necessary to serve the future of Paso Robles. This critical information is used in the rate setting process and CIP development. The sewer rate study is currently underway and is, is expected to be completed in the next few months. Next slide, please. The city's water distribution system. Oh, next slide, please. Here's some pictures of some of those um, CIP projects I mentioned and one that I didn't. Um, on the left, you see the this, the left shows the west side reservoir, the four million gallon reservoir, um, the new one that's being constructed after the demolition of the old one. The old one was an earthen reservoir. This one is a pre-stressed concrete reservoir that's partially buried. Um, on the right shows the two four million gallon uh, reservoirs that are uh, about to be recoded. And then on the bottom, you see the recently completed uh, surface water treatment plant that treats uh, surface water from Lake Nascimento. Next slide, please. The city's water distribution system is composed of 20 groundwater wells, seven booster stations, four reservoirs that contain approximately 12.2 million gallons of potable water. The system is divided into eight pressure zones, contains approximately 180 miles of main. In addition, the city water utilities, the city water utility operates four water treatment facilities, two wellhead treatment facilities that remove arsenic and two membrane facilities that um, are used to convert surface water into drinking water. And the water utility has um, several noteworthy projects that are currently underway um, or in the planning process. And those are those are listed here or in the planning process. We've got um, the four million gallon tank that's nearing completion now. It is operational, but um, there's still a little bit more work to do to, 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 fin to finish it out. Um, we're upgrading our controls and telemetry um, throughout the system to provide a more reliable, uh, more robust um, automation throughout the system. Um, we're working on our water master plan, something that wastewater just finished. We have an urban water management plan that's coming up. We're going to we're planning on looking at rates again here soon once we go through the, the master planning process. Um, and we are um, in the process of evaluating options for proceeding with a recycled water distribution system. Now that the tertiary treatment um, facility is complete at the wastewater plant, we have the ability to um, convey and sell 
um, recycle water. But what we're lacking right now are customers willing to contractually commit, and that's something we're working on um, as we speak. I am curious, the telemetry system, what do you use today? Um, I, I'm very familiar with SCADA systems, so I'm curious. Uh -huh. Yeah, we use radio right now, um, huh. and we're, we're switching over mostly to <clears throat> 900 megahertz. Sorry, um, what's the uh, what's the SCADA system that's in use? Um, from which point? So for the so on the software side and the HMI side, we use yeah. underwear primarily, uh, uh, treatment facilities. <clears throat> Got it. No, uh, is, have you guys looked at other systems that are maybe cheaper, like Ignition? Yep, and we're so we're using. It's interesting you brought that up. So we're currently in the process. Part of that SCADA upgrade is a distribution system from Wonderware to Ignition. <clears throat> Uh, okay. Yeah, I, I build these systems. Um, I, the system I use is primarily uses oil and gas, but I'm very familiar with everything you're talking about here. Uh, I want to I want to use the word strapping table just just so we could have like a wink wink nudge nudge kind of thing. Uh, that would be things. that would be interesting for to get your opinion on what we have. To see what your yeah, are. yeah. The uh, system that I, I'm actually a, a software product manager for a SCADA provider that does primarily offshore onshore uh, pipeline systems for oil and gas. Uh huh. But we have several customers that use our product for uh, city uh, water today. Oh, interesting. On the East Coast. So, yeah, I'd be curious. At, I mean, I don't want to stop everyone, but I would be curious to have a, a tour of the facility and take a peek. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Just last thing, real quick. Uh, what uh, protocols are you guys, are you, is your equipment using? Is it mostly Modbus or is there like DMP3 or some mm -hmm. other flavor? Um, on the on the older stuff, it's Modbus. On the newer yeah. stuff, um, I don't know. Dave would probably have a better idea. I maybe OPC. Call. What's that? OPC, maybe? Yeah, you I'm may. not sure. Okay, That's just curious. That. Sounds good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, next slide. Uh, airport. So for airport, since this is really outside my wheelhouse and I haven't had much time to get up to speed, I'm going to ask Roger to give an overview of the airport. who's our airport uh, manager, and he is on the line. Good evening. <clears throat> the airport is yet another of the city's assets, and it serves as a gateway into the community and a focal point um, for a number of essential services in the local area. The uh, public agency agencies that we support are obviously significant. The CAL FIRE Air Attack Base serves the air tankers and their firefighting uh, efforts in the area. The California Highway Patrol maintains their facility and three aircraft that patrol the area from Monterey on the north to Ventura on the south and east to the Kern County line. From patrol and pursuit activities to search and rescue with the helicopter, these services are also essential to the area. A new ambulance, uh, air ambulance company has just started operations. Mercy Air now has a helicopter and all of its support crew based here. Uh, they support primarily the North County area, but can certainly go farther if needed. The airport will see as many as a half dozen corporate jets come in each day with passengers who are conducting a variety of business activities in the local area. And then, of course, we serve the private general aviation market as well. We have just under 200 aircraft based here. Most are housed in the 150 private hangars on the airport. Uh, the airport is self-supporting. We operate from an enterprise fund where we generate all of the revenue we need to cover our direct expenses and support our operations. There are only about 5% of the general aviation airports in this country that can make that statement, so we are very fortunate. The FAA plays a key role in the existence of our airport. The one aspect I will mention here is the grant funding program for our capital improvements. Uh, as an example, a runway overlay will cost in excess of two and a half million dollars. There is no way that we can afford uh, a repair project of that magnitude. However, with FAA grant funding at 90% and an additional state grant funding program that covers another 5%, we only have to come up with 5% of the total cost of one of these major projects. And thus, we are able to maintain a phenomenal facility. I am we have, curious. So, oh, sure, real ahead. quick. Uh, I'm curious. So that's 95% of the cost. Is there, is there um, how to word that? What, what is it about that's unique about us that allows us to take advantage of those types of programs where 95% of the cost is covered? I'm, I'm not sure. I'm sure every uh, airport does not qualify for that. 
Is there something unique? Uh, to a certain degree, uh, we follow the programs. We submit the uh, uh, capital improvement list and uh, follow their programs uh, as uh, they are uh, they have various deadlines and so forth. A significant part of that is our ability to meet the grant match. And we have a separate bank account uh, set aside that's dedicated just to uh, keep that, uh, keep enough money in there to match grant funding when it comes up. Many of our projects will come up with, um, uh, as, a, as a result of another project at another airport falling out because they weren't able to come up with a match. And so mm -hmm. I'll just get a phone call from the FAA and say, um, would you like to go ahead and do the next project on your list? And uh, because we are able to match um, and we can uh, quickly do the engineering and get the, get the project underway, we have been successful on a number of these projects. Roger, isn't it also, sorry, this is Tom, isn't it also true because of our location and configuration of the airport that we are seen as a resource for regional um, needs and national needs? So isn't that also part of the attractiveness for our per airport for these grant programs? Yes, sir. It's very fortunate, or we're, we're very fortunate as being one of the, the larger of the small airports. Uh, this, uh, this gives us more of an advantage than when we had our air carrier operating certificate, which made us very small in the mm. large carrier market. Consequently, we were on the on the bottom end of everything. Once we um, surrendered that certificate, which we had to because of uh, changes in regulation, here we are as one of those larger airports. Um, and now we're competing with places like uh, King City and Los Banos and Porterville and airports mm. that are smaller that, uh, and uh, therefore we rank quite highly in the, in the overall consideration. Got it. So the size is the primary and then secondarily location and at what we service. And I think I think the um, um, services, the public services that I outlined are a large consideration. They see that kind of activity um, and consider you know, a Boeing 737 as a fire tanker uh, operating out of this airport. That's significant. And mm -hmm. the FAA feels a need to support that. Yes. Fantastic. Thank so you. Roger. Roger, yes. Viking Energy too. Is sure. it part of it that when Judge Clark was on uh, Reagan's cabinet, uh, FAA improved our runways to 727 capable, and also uh, one of our airport consultants had told us and and has shown that we are the best all weather airport in the continental United States. Well, there's no question about that. Yes, of course. Um, <laughs> But we have a uh, we have a facility that can then support uh, the aircraft, as you suggest. And um, all it takes is a well placed word here and there. Judge Clark was a very valuable asset uh, and a friend to the airport, uh, as you well know. And we have had others. And yes, that that's part of what has contributed to the position that we're in today. Excellent. Thank you. You bet. Um, we have an active economic development and promotion effort on the airport. We've identified areas that are suitable and available for new development under long-term leases. Uh, there is some activity there, but much of our current interest uh, right now is existing lessees who are working to either extend or re-identify their current leases. Uh, for whatever reason, they want to stay longer. Our day-to-day -day function on the airport is varied. Um, we maintain all of the airside operating areas, and it's over 60 acres of asphalt runways, taxiways, parking aprons, and so forth. We have an additional uh, 130 acres of designated safety area surrounding and adjacent to the runways and taxiways that we are required to maintain, mowing, grading, inspecting on a, re on a routine basis. We are responsible for six city-owned buildings on the airport. Uh, we have the firehouse, two large hangars, the terminal, and a couple of maintenance shops, um, as well as um, uh, landscaping that we maintain around the uh, terminal and in the entrance areas. We are landlord uh, slash property manager for around 30 long-term leases here on the airport. And that, of course, requires some of our time to meet the requests of those tenants and to administer the, uh, uh, the, uh, the those parts of the lease that, uh, that come up. Um, 
I leave you with um, the uh, an old adage in the airport business. Uh, if you have a mile of asphalt downtown, you can travel exactly one mile. At the airport, one mile of asphalt gives you access to the whole world. Uh, this is a great resource for the community to have. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next slide, please. You can skip that. Right, so in summary, Public Works is responsible for the operation, maintenance, and regulator regulatory compliance for all the infrastructure and utilities we just discussed. We do this with 55 staff members and an annual budget of $26 million. We also plan and execute capital projects needed to provide safe, reliable service 24-7 to existing residents and the future FASO. And that concludes my presentation. All right, it looks like I'm up. I didn't hear any questions for uh, Christopher. All right, so uh, my name is Ty Lewis. Uh, Jacob, I don't know that I've met you in the past. I'm the police chief uh, here in Paso Robles. Um, the picture that you see there is a couple of years old. We're due for a new uh, department photo, uh, but with the pandemic, uh, we haven't been able to pull that off. So uh, you get a couple year old photo of the department but a lot of those same faces are there. Um, and of course, on the right is our public safety building. And if you'd like a tour of the building at some point, you're more than welcome to uh, uh, come and see me and we'll uh, give you a tour of the police department. Next slide. So our organization, this is um, currently, we have uh, approximately 53, um, excuse me, 56 full-time uh, positions allotted to the police department. Uh, that includes uh, myself all the way down to um, the uh, non sworn personnel. Uh, we have eight dispatchers in the police department. We have approximately uh, 37 uh, police officers, as well as three records clerks. We have uh, community service officers, uh, all that round out the police department. But our sworn staffing right now is about 37 police officers. Um, that varies uh, depending on uh, people coming and going, quitting, uh, retiring, all of those kind of things. Um, but uh, we use our, uh, our we, we break our, our department up into three divisions, essentially. One is operations, and I tell everybody, when you think of our operations depart bureau, think of everybody in a uniform. Anybody in a uniform re re reports to a commander, Commander Davis, who's in charge of um, operations. We also have a support services division, uh, which is um, mainly, it, it, it's kind of split into two. We have records and dispatch, which Mary Spawn Holtz uh, is our records and dispatch uh, supervisor. And then we have a commander who's in charge of our detective bureau, our property room, um, and our um, those specialty groups underneath there, including our school resource officers. Um, and so that's, uh, and they all report to, to me. I also currently have a crime analyst um, position allotted to me, which hasn't been filled yet. Um, I have a, a part-time executive assistant that helps me with uh, various aspects of uh, my administrative duties upstairs, but we're hopeful that by the springtime, uh, she will have wrapped up uh, several of her um, crime analyst uh, 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 classes and uh, will apply for uh, an internal recruitment position for that uh, particular spot. Next slide. So here's kind of our breakdown of our staffing comparisons uh, by year, uh, just to give you a little bit of historical context on where we've been and where we are. Um, you can tell that at least in the sworn officer category that we haven't grown much um, in the, since 1991. In fact, uh, as recently as 2008, we actually dropped down to about 25 police officers at one point, with our peak being in 2007 at 41 police officers. Um, as you can imagine, has been um, discussed much in the news recently and at city council meetings um, and with the J-20 measure, 
um, our police department. Um, you know, we're really working hard to find revenue streams uh, that will help, uh, you know, plan for the future. Our community has grown much since 1991 and in fact, 2007, including our tourism, um, our development that's mm -hmm. on the uh, cusp of being built. Uh, so there's a lot of changes. Next I am slide. curious. I am curious. Yes, can I ask uh, two questions? Sure. Uh, I'm curious about the 1991 uh, data point. What's the significance of 1991? Well, I think it's just more of historical context for you. So we have numbers going back. Uh, some of those are some of the older numbers that I could find that actually listed our staffing. So mm -hmm. you can, by way of comparison, our 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 um, our population in 1991 was uh, sub 20,000, I believe. And okay. now in 2020, we're you know pushing 32,000 with over a million and a half visitors coming through, and we're only up at 37 police officers. Yeah, and that was my next question. Actually, was you, you have this natural swell, if you will, or uh, uh, yeah, wax and wane of population growth over the weekends or specific times, and it's it'd be interesting to see what that healthy um, uh, the, what's the word I want to use? I guess uh, the allocation of officers relative to the population at a given point in time to see what a, an effective or what a, a recommended effectiveness would be uh, versus what we actually have today. As a, I mean, the numbers are great, but they don't mean much to me in this current state. You know no, I mean? no, absolutely. And that's, uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I pro provide these as just way of context, but I'm happy mm -hmm. to kind of discuss. Uh, we did it in two, next slide, please. In uh, 2018, and this it kind of uh, goes into some of these staffing ratios that I'm going to show you, that um, a lot of people compare uh, staffing ratios to the, the, you know, the amount of sworn officers to your residents. So you come up with the general plan, which for years has called for 1.4 to 1.6 officers per thousand residents but as you uh it keenly pointed out that uh, that doesn't really per you know really give us an idea of how many officers that we need to effectively police our community mm -hmm. um you can kind of see there some of the ratios that have happened over the years um and like i said this is just more of way of historical context but i'm happy to provide you some more details in a moment next slide sure. so um our demand for police services, and this is going to dovetail right into your question. Um, over the last five years, we've seen a 40% increase in calls for service. So what does that mean, actually? Um, what does 40% look like? Uh, right now, we are running approximately 45,000 calls per service per year, which is the highest in the county for any police um, agency, any municipal police agency, only second to the sheriff's department. Our closest comparator would be San, the city of San Luis Obispo, who has a larger population than we do and more police officers. They have 60, uh, 62 sworn officers and they run approximately 1500 calls per year less than we do. Um, and that directly correlates in our ability to provide service to our community uh, due to the increase in calls. And that's borne out in this number um, of 2,500 times last year that we weren't able to respond to a call for service. Our call, our call load has increased so much in the last five plus years that our officers are finding that they don't have much proactive policing opportunities. Uh, we're a very reactive police department. So um, I think the city manager might have mentioned earlier on in our conversation that uh, oftentimes uh, we only have uh, three or four police officers out to police our entire community with a supervisor. Uh, which is difficult uh, to find any kind of proactive police work, which is uh, proven that, you know, to prevent a crime is much easier than it is to solve a crime. Uh, we also have an aging infrastructure and that one of the highlights that we're looking at trying to replace right now, uh, which affects the fire and police department, is our outdated 911 systems. Not only our computer systems that support our, our computer-aided dispatching, uh, but our records management system, as well as all of our radio system uh, infrastructure is at end of life. We currently use Motorola system and Motorola no longer makes parts for our in-car radios, for our repeaters, uh, all of the um, systems that we are critical backbone infrastructure for communication are at end of life. All of that hardware that's end of life, do you guys have a backlog of equipment in case of failure or is that just kind of beg, borrow, steal to replace? 
We begged, borrow, and steal. The last repair that we had to do, I believe um, Grover Beach stepped up. They had just replaced Mm. their radio system and had a similar um, repeater, and we were able to take parts from them uh, to be able, or maybe it was the school district. I'm trying to remember. One of the two, we were able to actually um, use their used equipment to get ours running. Uh, We're currently in the middle of um, trying to get our system spec'd out and funded uh, to be able to get this project underway, hopefully, uh, maybe by the end of the year, if we're lucky, if not uh, the first part of 2021. Got it. And I'm assuming a lot of that equipment has a pretty healthy, like, mean time between failures. So even though you've got equipment that's old, it's rated well, (laughs) I don't know. (laughs) I'm just trying to think out loud. Yeah, Um, these are these are real problems that have to be solved. But I'm thinking like, if you're buying or not buying, if you're getting equipment, that's, you know, however old this other stuff is 10, 15 years. Uh, it's not really good. Right. So this is this all this equipment that we're currently operating on was installed when the public safety building was um, built back around 2003. Um, so that that tells you how old all this equipment is. Um, we do buy good equipment um, just for that reason. It's such a critical um, component of our uh, of our our jobs and our safety. Um, that we we do try and buy good equipment. We have maintenance contracts. We do have people um, that can help us get us up in emergencies. But we're we're pushing the cusp of uh, of safety uh, for, for not only our officers by the commu- but also for the community until this system gets replaced. Cool. And then the last question, just forgive my ignorance on this. Um, I I'm my eyes are keying on the word service calls for service. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, maybe if you have this elsewhere in a slide, I could see it, but is there a breakdown on the types of service that you provide and the quantities of each type? So I, I don't have a slide in there, but I can try and answer your questions. So there's sure. two types of there's two types of calls for service that we operate under. One is what we call um, those that are initiated by the, the community, community calls for service. And then there's a second type, which are officer initiated calls for service. So oftentimes, um, say your car gets broken into, you pick up your phone and you call dispatch, um, then you're going to create a, um, a community call for service. And I can tell you that right now that uh, the ratio is almost split down the middle. However, community calls for service outweigh officer initiated. Um, I think uh, if I remember the numbers correctly off the top of my head, we have about 25 to 27,000 community um, originated, and then we have about 17 to 18,000 officer initiated uh, community call or calls for service. So those officer initiated ones might be if we're driving down the road and we see a suspicious person that's creeping around a car and we stop that person, that generates a call for service as well. Got it. Thank you. That helps me a lot. Yep, you bet. Next slide. So this kind of uh, might answer some of your questions about how we compare and um, where we are. So I'm going to start with the bottom slide because you kind of keyed in on that um, uh, when you were asking your questions about staffing ratios. So in 2018, when I became police chief, I initiated a staffing analysis to determine what the proper staffing ratios based upon uh, national trends, um, best practices, uh, and um, I'm happy to get that to you if you'd like to read it. Uh, it's um, it's great reading material if you need to go to sleep at night. <laughs> but uh, it does break down the math on how we come up with this. And essentially, uh, there the, the International Association of Chiefs of Police, um, at, along with PERF, who is the Police Executive Research Foundation, uh, came up with the uh, they they surveyed a lot of different uh, police departments, large and small, medium and determined that the national best practice regarding staffing is to be able to have at least 30% of your time uh, that is what we call proactive policing and 70% of your time should be dedicated to answering community calls for service. Currently, our um, staffing is uh, to the point where the majority of our time, um, sometimes up to 80 to 90% of our time is spent answering community calls for service. And in order to do proactive proactive policing, we often have to let calls hold to be able to get there. So that begs the question, based upon our calls for service, how many police officers do we need? Well, to be operationally um, proficient, we need 57 police officers based on 2018 numbers. So currently I told you we had 37 or thereabouts. 
We need about 20, 20 more police officers just to be able to meet national standards or recommendations when it comes to our policing needs here in the community, uh, which is very tough when we're under the, uh, you know, the budget constraints and the economic crisis that we've gone through over the last 13 plus years. It seems like we never fully recover from those. To answer your question about some of the breakdown, mm -hmm. Uh, you can see here that uh, one of our big calls for service that we deal with on a regular basis that doesn't reflect any of our crime trends, whether that's violent crime or property crimes, which is what the FBI tracks, is our over 1,000 calls or close to 1,000 calls related to transient and mental health issues per year. Um, that's probably one of our bigger numbers um, of calls for service that we go to. Um, and uh, of course we have in this community, we have a lot of quality of life uh, calls for service for our community, whether it's citizens assist. Uh, we have a lot of alcohol related calls, a lot of DUIs. Uh, we have um, drug related issues. All of those um, make up a, a large percent of our calls for service that don't necessarily, necessarily reflect in crime trends uh, that are reported um, by the state of California or the FBI. Yeah, and that's interesting because uh, the transient mental health, I, I did a ride along with uh, some of your officers, I think uh, earlier or late last year, um, and we did respond to several of those and they seem to take a lot of time. Is there any idea of the, the, the what's the word I want to use, I guess the investment per call type or anything like that? Have you guys ever done that, any kind of analysis to that level? Yeah, so we can actually, our, that's part of the problem with uh, we need to replace our records management and CAD uh, system. Uh, that Those systems aren't as robust in the reporting area that we would like. We're very much into ComStat. Um, that was one of the reasons going back when I taught, when I highlighted the crime analyst position. Uh, mm -hmm. Crime analyst is really going to be able to help me dive into some of those numbers and make more meaningful sense uh, to you. Um, Got it. Yep. So, um, you know, you can kind of see how, how we're doing there. And where this really shows up is uh, we've had a 90% increase in priority one uh, call response time since 2015. So uh, just what that means is that's, you know, priority one is immediate threat to life. So if somebody, say we get a call that um, maybe there's a, an injury collision where somebody's pinned in where the fire department's gonna come to us, or we have somebody that reports they're being stabbed uh, with a knife or some sort of immediate assault. Um, all of those are considered um, priority one calls. Priority two calls are our second most important and those are immediate threats to property. So maybe a burglary in progress or some sort of theft that um, is going on right now and we have a suspect on scene. Our average response time to those types of calls is in the neighborhood of nine minutes. You compare that to national standards on the fire side and their immediate threat to life, they're looking to get there within four minutes or less. Um, oftentimes we overlap on calls, whether it's medical emergency calls, our officers show up to help out with those and oftentimes we're first on scene on some of those. Uh, but when you go back and you look at our overall response times, we're pushing 15 plus minutes on um, our response times to all response calls. So a lot of times people are um, essentially waiting for us to free up to be able to get to um, these calls for service and help, which again, ultimately impacts our ability to um, provide proacting policing uh, to our community. Yeah, and I didn't see any metric that showed um, like a queuing effect, because if you're waiting 10 minutes or 15 minutes, how often do you find that you've queued up three calls simultaneously or 10 calls or 100 calls? Like how, what's, what does that normally look like for the department? Yeah, so that's a, that's a great question that I can get back to you and answer you on. Okay. Uh, we do have limited information. <laughs> Again, I don't want to make this sound like an excuse, but uh, mm -hmm. look, looking through some of our metric uh, capabilities with our current system um, is a problem. Uh, we try and answer the phones and get those calls queued up quickly. I can tell you that we've held calls as much as as long as an hour or more. Um, and we do have breakdowns that kind of break down that'll tell you uh, how long it takes us to answer a call how long it takes to enter the call into the computer, to the time it takes to dispatch, to the time that it takes on scene, all of those metrics are there as well. Um, the state helps us with our 911 system and will tell mm -hmm. us how many times that uh, calls have remained in queue without being answered because we didn't have the capability to do it. 
Um, so we do have some of those metrics available. And if you have specific questions, feel free to email me or call me mm -hmm. and okay. I can try and get that information to you. Really appreciate it. And, you know, I have one more question, but I want to hog all the time. It sounds like someone else had a question. I'll go ahead and let them step in. So, hi, this is Steve Gregory. Hi, I Steve. Have a couple of quick questions for you um, related to this. So, can you discuss your recruitment mm -hmm. efforts so we can hear about that again? Did you say recruitment? Yes. Sure. So recruitment uh, for us in the last uh, several years, uh, well, since I've become chief, we've really had a focus on trying to recruit local um, Paso Robles residents into our police department. And there's a few reasons why we do that. So one is that uh, ever since the, the laws have changed with um, changing public um, retirement systems to the PEPRA, which is for police officers now is 2.7 at 57. Uh, that has really kind of put a freeze on a lot of lateral officers or people with experience uh, that want to change departments because a lot of times they have to go to a lesser retirement system. They leave and uh, in our case, we have a tier two retirement. If you're already a lateral officer, you're gonna add five years to your career by coming to work for the Paso Robles Police Department. Um, if you are a new employee, say from out of state, um, you come in at the 2.7 at 57. So um, our recruitment efforts have largely been um, really focused on our local community. Not only do we want to have a, a, you know, police officers that are reflective of the community that they serve, um, but we find that those police officers are very much invested in keeping their community safe. Uh, they have a, a richer and broader public support because they know people oftentimes uh, they've gone to school with people. Um, they've built relationships. I liken it to um, if you have a good plumber and a friend of yours asks you for a recommendation for a plumber, you're going to recommend you know who you have a great experience with. And it's the same thing here in the in the city of Pass Robles. When we recruit local people, uh, they, they often have great reputations within the community. They're homeowners here. Their tax dollars are spent here. Um, we save in costs, uh, soft costs that may not be readily available, whether it's commute times um, or, you know, just overall job satisfaction uh, shows up in those kind of areas. So our recruitment uh, over the last couple of years, the city council has been very gracious in providing us with some overhires to help us keep up with attrition, meaning that they've given us uh, some uh, positions that uh, reflect, uh, you know, being able to get people into the police academy uh, and having people in queue to get us through quicker. And I'm getting the, uh, I need to speed it up a little bit because we have other people. Um, but that, does that answer your question, Mr. Gregory? Yeah, and I just have one quick question. Are you going to experience a little boon from all the larger police departments resigning? That's what that, that remains to be seen. I don't know that uh, any of them, uh, we have a pretty high cost of living, which also kind of uh, makes it difficult to recruit. Okay, thank you very much, Ty. Yep, next slide. I have one question, if I might. Yeah. And that is, uh, going down to your, your bottom spot on that slide, of how many officers you need. Right. If you became fully staffed to where you'd like to be, what would the annual salary cost be? And then what would the annual complete package cost be? Sure. So that's a, that's a number that we're still uh, trying to work through. The best comparison I can give you is uh, San Luis Obispo, whose salaries are quite a bit higher than us. As I mentioned, they have about 62 police officers. Uh, and um, a, a more robust uh, payroll. And they're at about $16 million per year for their payroll. Um, I'm guessing our number is gonna be somewhere, probably a couple million dollars less than that. Um, but you know, that it's a little bit of a moving target because we would have to calculate those numbers in today's numbers, which uh, our contracts and so forth are constantly changing and trying to hit that number. But that's my best guess. If we were to get all the, officers we'd need, we'd be probably be somewhere around the 14 to $15 million number. For just the new people or total? Total. Total. So and what are you at now? We're at 11.5 million right now. So we're looking at about 4 million. Correct. Somewhere in that number, neighborhood. Thank you. And so this, this number kind of here shows uh, some of the information that I'd already previously discussed. Last slide, I believe.
And with that, I can. I, I think we've answered a lot of questions. I'll turn it over to, I think, Jonathan's next. Thank you, Jeff Lewis. Good evening, Jacob. I'm Jonathan Stornetta, the Fire Chief. I've been with the Pass Rebels Fire Department for 20 years. In total, I have 27 years in the fire service. I came to Pass Rebels as a fire department or as a firefighter from another fire department in San Luis Obispo County. And since I started here 20 years ago, I've worked my way through the ranks. And in 2017, I was appointed to the Fire Chief position. My family has been in the area since the late 1800s and remains very involved in agriculture throughout the county. And being uh, a resident of this county for so long and growing up here, I've obviously witnessed uh, per personally a lot of changes in this community. I can tell you when I started working here, there was one fire station and one fire engine that protected a community of about 19,000. And much of the east side of the city was grain fields and cattle ranches. Today, we have two fire stations that protect a population of over 32,000 residents and 2 million visitors a year. Now much of the east side of the city is residential developments and commercial buildings. With all of these changes in the community in a relatively short period of time, the fire department has not been able to keep pace with the demands of emergency response. We currently operate out of two fire stations. Our downtown fire station is Fire Station 1. It has one fire engine that is staffed with three firefighters, and we also have a staffed paramedic squad staffed with two firefighters. Our second station, our Fire Station 2, is located out near Food for Less off Santa Fe Road. That station has one fire engine staffed with three firefighters. Both fire stations operate 24-7, 365, and a community of our size needs a minimum of three fire stations and three fire engines operating all times, which was evident in the last uh, insurance service office survey assessment that was done just a couple of months ago when I presented the council and uh, it clearly identified the community. Certain parts of the community are significantly underserved by only having two um, fire engines. Additionally, based on that ISO rating, it does reflect an insurance premiums and it, as we've seen and heard from community members, they're seeing their insurance uh, premiums double and sometimes triple and even like uh, Councilman Hammond have their insurance canceled because of the fire department's response capabilities. So currently in Paso Robles, we have the two busiest fire stations in the county. Our 911 responses have increased by over 400% since the early 90s. And in just the past five years alone, our responses have increased by 28%. Next slide, please. This chart displays how our organization is laid out. We have our administrative staff that includes myself, a fire marshal, fire prevention specialist, and an administrative assistant. Our operational staff consists of 27 firefighters and three battalion chiefs. Firefighters and battalion chiefs are split into three different shifts. That's an A shift, B shift, and C shift, as you can see on the, the organizational chart there. It's structured so that our firefighters work 48 hours on and then they get 96 hours off. Uh, due to our limited staffing, it is not uncommon for our firefighters to work 72 or 96 hours straight. Also, right now during fire season, our firefighters are working much more. For example, with all the firefighters currently going on throughout the state, the majority of our firefighters have been on duty for almost a month already, so a month straight. And we expect this to continue till November. Usually October, November is our busiest time. We have currently 11 firefighters uh, scattered throughout California and they have not been home in almost four weeks. And uh, due to our staffing, when they do return, they will work directly out of the fire station. So they will not be coming home and we will replace them with people that are currently working in the fire station. So not much of a break for our firefighters during fire season. Next slide, please. We provide a number of services um, and our community, as you know, is uh, constantly growing and changing and that requires that uh, we keep pace with it and we change with the needs of the community. So for medical, medical emergency medical services, um, we provide it at the paramedic level and on all of our responding apparatus, there is a paramedic. As paramedics, uh, they can do such things as administer medications, 12 lead EKGs, intubate patients, chest decompressions and so on. 911 calls for medical assistance is constantly increasing. Uh, 
there's a number of reasons for this. Um, one is that we have the most people over the age of 65 than uh, any other community in the county. In fact, 52% uh, of our calls for those over the age, 52% of those calls are for people over the age of 65. And additionally, we have 20 congregate care facilities in the city, totaling over 333, 331 rooms with an additional 220 rooms to be occupied before the end of the year. And that would be the facility you see uh, being built next to Kennedy there. So those calls at those facilities um, dramatically increase our annual call volume. We also provide fire, prevention, fire suppression services. And in the city, we have over 12,000 residential units and 1,500 businesses and 90 three-story buildings that we need to protect and respond to when a structure fire occurs. Due to our limited staffing, uh, we are only able to respond nine people to a fire and the national average for just a home that's less than 2,000 square feet is 15 people. So we can't even meet the minimum requirements as outlined by the National Fire Protection Agency. And to just give you an example, high hazard occupancy, say a three-story um, apartment or you know Lowe's, Walmart or a shopping center takes 48 people and there's not enough people, not only in our um, city here, but the surrounding county as well. Mm. Additionally, wildland fires are becoming the new norm in California, as I'm sure you're aware and you've seen. In the last three years alone, we have responded to over 425 wildland fires just within the city limits. And um, as you've seen from probably the June 22nd river fire, you can see how dangerous those fires are when they get outside of the riverbed. Yeah. Another, oh, I'm sorry, where are you at? Oh, um, yes. Yeah, sorry. I forgot to mute myself. I was agreeing with you. Uh, but I, oh, am, okay. I, I originally went to school to be a paramedic. Oh, great. Yeah, so I'm actually curious, is uh, privatized uh, ambulance services uh, present in Paso? I'm, they I'm are. Not... We, they, they are. We have a for-profit ambulance company in uh, that has the contract for San Luis Obispo County. So to just give you an idea, that the ambulance company has about eight stations and they cover 3,200 square miles. So to narrow it down a little bit, we have one ambulance here in Paso Robles. That ambulance covers approximately 1,200 square, square miles. It's not committed to the city at all. Um, it responds all the way up to North Shore, uh, San Antonio area, Heritage Ranch, mm -hmm. all the way out to Fresno Kings and Monterey County line. So people usually ask, why do you have paramedics on fire engines? It's because typically we don't have an ambulance available in the city to, to start that immediate paramedic assessment and mm -hmm. give medications. And I'm sure you're aware of the benefits of being a paramedic since you <laughs> that role. I was a paramedic for 24 years. So, um, yeah, I don't need to explain any further of why it's important to have paramedics on the fire engine. No, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Jonathan? Yes, sir. How many uh, paramedics do we have on staff? Um, I don't know the exact number, but it's at least half because just to keep uh, at least one on each piece of apparatus at all times. That's pretty, ex that's pretty exciting. Thanks. Yes, um, I can tell you this department was um, BLS, so basic life support, up until uh, 2000. And then it went to paramedics and we were the last municipal department in the county to go with paramedics. Does that mean there's no EMTs present? It's only there is. So the rest of them are all EMTs. Uh, I got it. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, uh, significant. It'd be a significant cost increase if we had all paramedics. But. Yes, <laughs> just checking. Thank yes. you. Hey, hey, Jonathan, it's uh, 17 out of your 27. Ah, thank you, Ryan. Appreciate that. It's good to have your finance guy in the background. So uh, another area the fire department's become more involved in and requires annual mandated training is the area of hazardous materials. In the city alone, we have 164 facilities classified as using more than small quantities of hazardous materials. Uh, next area here is technical rescue. Oh, go back, please. And uh, we have our staff that's specially trained and responds to technical rescues, such as cliffside rescues, confined space, and swift water. And in 2018, um, our swift water rescuers in the fire department rescued 12 people from the Salinas Riverbed. We put firefighters in the, the water and also put them on helicopters to get the people out of the riverbed. And additionally, uh, you know, our confined space uh, firefighters that were trained actually rescued the uh, construction workers that were stuck in the Nosmino water pipeline that broke at the corner of South River and Niblick. So 
I won't go through all of the services that we provide. We'd be here all night, um, but there's a pretty good overview right there. Um, we are an all risk fire department and uh, the community has come to expect these services from our fire department. Um, so unless you have any questions about them, um, I'll continue to move on. Sounds good, thank you. Okay, next slide, please. As far as response types, medical responses account for 78% of our calls. As mentioned earlier, our community is home to the largest elderly population in the county. We continue to build care facilities and residential developments for those over the age of 55, and Pass Robles has become the sought after place for people wanting to retire. Based on our current analysis of future EMS demands, we project that the 65 and older population will increase by 14% within 20 years. By the year 2030, all baby boomers will be older than the age of 65. This will expand the size of the elderly population so that one in every five residents will be retirement age. And we're already seeing re research that indicates that by 2030, the elderly population will outnumber children for the first time in US history. Based on these studies and projected housing developments, we anticipate our 911 responses to increase by 40%. Wow, I am curious, these metrics you've got here, um, how, what is the time frame you're rolling up for this pie graph? Is this 10 days, years, months? This is one year, this is 2019 right there. Got we it. Run, we run approximately 4,000 calls annually. The, so it's about, you know, right, split in half, 2,000 calls per station. The next busiest would be the city of San Luis Obispo runs about 1,700 calls uh, per station. Hmm. And they run, just to give you an idea of, uh, you know, how many responses we have, just like Chief Lewis said, we're pretty comparable to San Luis. San Luis runs 6,000 calls annually. They have four stations. They're working on their fifth, and we run 4,000 calls annually, and we have two stations. So. Do you, and as a, another quick follow-on, uh, you said that the those facilities that are being constructed for the, you know, the retirement age folks, is there a correlation between uh, those facilities being live or active and a reduction in the medical calls? Does that actually have an, an effect? If the facility is occupied, or not yeah. occupied? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, versus it, it, if it's occupied. Yeah, it has a substantial effect. Hmm. Okay, yes. thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Next slide, please. So this uh, this graph here outlines where our fire fire station locations are. The two that we have, the two small red boxes, are the locations of the one on the left is fire station one, and the one on the right is fire station two. The shaded areas on the slide there, the blue area, and then the yellow the yellow area, those outline our four minute response times. Um, the city council adopted a goal back in 2001 that we respond to all emergencies in four minutes or less 90 percent of the time. Um, currently, we are achieving that response goal 56% of the time. There are two reasons for this. The first is that we do not have adequate staffing, and the second is that we need another fire station. All the areas you see on the graph above that are shaded in black are the areas that we cannot respond to within four minutes. So this significantly impacts our response times. Um, as ISO identified, most of that area in black is a part of our community that is significantly underserved. So adding a station in the black shaded area will better position us to meet the city council response goals and provide an equal level of service to all members of our community. We did purchase a piece of property last year out off Union Road up in that black area. I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, probably not. Um, for, that's for future site for fire station three and uh, the police. And since the COVID, thank you for whoever has the arrow there. Um, due to the the current fiscal restraints, all planning was put on hold for that third station. Next slide, please. The slide in front of you is this is our 10 year staffing analysis. This analysis identifies the staffing required to appropriately address our aging population, the impacts we see from tourism and future housing developments. Currently, our department is short fire fire, five firefighters and that's reflected in our inability to meet the needs of the community, our response times, and our ability to provide the necessary services. So for example, currently uh, we are unable to meet about 250 911 calls a year. So what does that mean when we can't respond to those 911 calls? Then we rely on CAL FIRE to come in and assist us. Um, but since CAL FIRE and the state so short on resources, we're actually helping them right now. So um, if we have uh, simultaneous calls, um, almost one a day, then you can ex 
expect to probably wait 10 to 15 minutes. If we're actually on a fire, the, the wait's going to be much longer. And going back to this 10 year staffing plan, you, you can see it's all based on a year's and expected population. So for the population growth and actually, you know what? I apologize. That looks appears to be the older graph. We have one based on. Um, no, that's correct. One. I'm sorry. So yes, it's uh, based on uh, integrated with population and the years. So, so at right away we need five firefighters and we're looking at somewhere around 600,000 for that. And that's cumulative over the next um, 10 years. So a total price in the next 10 years, about 3 million. So Jonathan, where's the third fire department, fire station come in on this graph? The fire station would come into this graph as soon as we hire three more firefighters. If we could hire three more firefighters, that would give us sufficient staffing to open the fire station three. Okay. And, uh, for me, uh, the question I have is, uh, you know, resource finding adequate resources quickly seems to be difficult for some. How difficult is it for you to staff up the fire department? If I let's just say you just happen upon all the money you needed, um, how quickly could you turn that, that money into a headcount? If we it, probably about three months. Three months. Okay, thank yep. you. Three months. Okay, that concludes my portion of the presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Jonathan. So um, I am Ryan Cornell. I am the admin services director. I um, um, have been in the area for almost 30 years. Uh, I graduated from Aurora Grande High. I was kind of more in the South County um, area. Went to Cal Poly uh, in 2000 and graduated in 2005 from, from there. And then um, right after I uh, had graduated, I started working for a CPA firm um, in Santa Maria where I did um, audits of local government, cities, school districts, um, some community services districts and, and nonprofits. Um, after that, um, one of my clients that I had worked for, um, the city of Aurora Grande, uh, kind of poached me and, and um, I got on board in the city of Aurora Grande as an accounting supervisor. Um, spent about you know five, six years there. Um, I, I did a little stunt in the city of Santa Maria uh, before I landed here in Paso in 2017. Um, as the finance manager and then uh, about nine months ago uh middle of december um, i was um, promoted to the, the director role i'll go ahead and move to the next slide dave so um, uh, my department has uh, two main divisions um, one is the finance division and the other one is human resources and it's kind of a slash risk management uh, we kind of have both of those roles in, in, uh, rolled into one uh, we have 13 uh, total staff members uh, four of, or I'm sorry, three of which are in HR. Uh, the rest are um, are in the finance side of things. Uh, next slide. So um, we 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 break into um, in the finance world. There's there's right the big one of the big uh, items that we work on is financial reporting, and there's two main documents that that we produce um, each year. Um, the one on the right is the comprehensive annual financial report. It's also referred to as uh, the CAFR. Um, that is an audited document. We do have independent auditors come and review our um, financial transactions uh, each and every year. Uh, though that report um, does meet uh, general accounting uh, principles and, and um, meets all of the state and, and regulatory requirements. Um, because it takes, uh, takes actual transactions that happen in a year, uh, that report doesn't usually get published until six months after the end of the close of the fiscal year. So we run on fiscal years. It starts on July 1st and ends on June 30th. And so for the uh, the uh, information from 2019-20 uh, uh, probably won't be uh, issued until December, January uh, coming up. Uh, the uh, second uh, uh, important document obviously is the city budget. Um, and that's kind of shown on the left and that, and that's almost that's that's looking forward right that's kind of the financial plan um, of what we expect uh, in the coming year uh, typically we do um, uh, budgets on a uh, biannual basis meaning we do two-year budgets uh, this past year we made a decision to only adopt the one-year budget uh, because of COVID-19 the benefits of doing two years is where right, it's kind of a bigger picture, long, longer term planning, uh, but it's really hard to predict what what revenues we're, we're going to do. And so I didn't necessarily feel comfortable um, assuming 
of any sort of revenue assumptions in 21, 22 until we kind of knew um, how we were going to uh, come along on the on the pandemic. Um, in total, uh, the city has uh, 38 funds. Um, I look at funds as separate businesses, and and I know Christopher kind of touched based on it earlier. Um, today, but uh, we have separate funds for the water enterprise. We have a separate fund for this wastewater, uh, for airport. Um, so almost in a way, it's it's like a, a, a water business and a, and a wastewater business, and we keep all of the accounting completely separate um, in each one of those. So so the revenues and expenses all stay kind of in, in one um, fund. And, and like Christopher said, we, we are legally not allowed to co-mingle uh, those monies. They have to be accounted for separately. Um, and that's kind of what the CAFR does is is making sure that we are not commingling those funds um, and whatnot. So the uh, total budget uh, for all the funds is uh, 106.9 million, um, of which the general fund is um, just over 46 million, 46.3 million. Uh, the general fund is—I is, um, don't like to use the word phrase "catch-all," but it is kind of the catch-all. It's the—it's any of the services that aren't necessarily uh, paid for by customers. Uh, so those tend to be the uh, police services and fire services, uh, um, community development, and, and community services. Uh, go ahead to the next slide, please, uh, Dave. So um, the next. Uh, aspect that the finance department does is we have one dedicated uh, finance personnel that that handles kind of our, our general billing and receivables. Uh, she's also responsible for the business licensing, uh, making sure that those uh, applications come in, uh, make sure that when we uh, every year when we renew those those um, renewals go out. Um, she also handles the uh, collections of the transient occupancy tax uh, that's referred to as a TOT. Uh, so as you can see, we we do have a little over 4,100 uh, business active business licenses today. Uh, it generates an uh, annual revenue of about a half a million dollars a year. And then on the TOT side of things, we we have 22 hotels, uh, two RV parks, and 338 short-term rentals. Uh, the TOT does compromise about 15 to 20 percent. I put a range in there uh, only because uh, this fiscal year's uh, TOT revenues are obviously. Um, a little under uh, typical norm, so it's actually this year is, is going to probably hover right around 15 percent. But in typical years, it's it's closer to the 17, 20 percent range, and that's about uh, six million dollars annually that we receive in TOT collections. Um, kind of a goal for for that role and position is just kind of an update and a policy on on how we collect our, our cash, not only here in this department but but citywide. And just for my own edification, that six million represents the 20 percent range, or is that just a general? Like it's, in between. It's the in between. Got it. Thank you. Yep. Um, and I, I should have said too, I'm, I'm back on the financial reporting too. Uh, you know, I, I could dive into both of those documents for, for hours um, at a time too. So um, I think it's if you do, you know, you know I'll send you links on, on where you can find them and view them. Um, but we could definitely have a, a chat offline uh, to dive in a little bit more deeper on, on what those um, schedules and reports mean. That would be great. Thank you. Uh, Dave, going to the next slide. So, um, two other functions that the finance uh, um, department or division does is it, uh, payroll and accounts payable. Uh, we have a dedicated finance uh, personnel to each one of those functions. Um, on the payroll side, we uh, process about 213 employee checks. That's full time and part time um, employees every other week. Um, she does um, reconcile and pay all the benefits. That's the the health benefits, the dental, vision. Uh, life insurance and, and the like. She's, um, she's also responsible for doing all of the quarterly tax reporting um, to both the federal and state um, agencies. Um, and then we kind of have a goal um, for for payroll um, on there and kind of in the in the longer term horizon of a new tight keeping system. Um, right now, it is definitely a manual process for each individual employees to submit their um, time um, entry. Um, on the other side, as you can see, there is accounts payable. Um, that's just running right or cutting all the checks uh, to our vendors. Uh, we process uh, right around 200 to 300 each week. Um, she's also uh, responsible for uh, managing and monitoring um, each of the city credit cards. Um, she's also responsible for um, issuing and, and, and monitoring uh, all the purchase orders um, that the city does and make sure we have the proper approvals. 
Um, and then we do have a goal, it's been kind of a long-term goal to update our purchasing policy um, to, to be a little bit more streamlined, to be a little bit more consistent with industry practice. Next slide, thanks Dave. Um, and then lastly, the last uh, component of the finance division is uh, utility billing. Um, that's um, the billing for the water and wastewater services um, in the city. Uh, we have um, more than 10,000 accounts. Uh, we do bill monthly. Um, and those 10,000 accounts are, are managed by uh, four uh, individuals. We have one uh, utility billing supervisor and three customer service representatives there. Um, we did uh, recently update our UV system um, back in November of 2019. Um, it's been a long transition process. We um, are still not 100% um, fully implemented um, as of today. Um, but we are actually really, really close. So that, that's um, a good news there. Um, and then just to kind of um, throw on your radar, we are looking at, at rate studies and, and uh, we're, uh, for wastewater where it's already kind of conducted on the way, uh, we could expect the, the results of that study in early 2021. Um, and then we are currently, again, Christopher's working on his uh, master planning for the water side of things so that we can uh, ex examine the rates uh, late to early 22. And 23. Um, the other uh, division in the department is human resources. So uh, just like any other uh, entity, uh, human resources does a lot. They have a lot of um, um, aspects to juggle. And I, I like that graphic right there on the right because I, that they really are kind of involved in each one of those um, aspects. So we have uh, 228.66 full-time equivalent employees. Uh, 172 of those are funded um, in the general fund. And so we ha only have one human resources manager and two HR specialists to, to help with the, the recruitment of those positions, uh, to help with the um, enrolling of employee benefits and coordinating their leaves, um, and then most importantly, the development. So um, we, we have a lot of goals um, for the division. Uh, we have outdated personnel rules and regs. Uh, we do want to explore and, and expand our uh, onboarding program so that they get a little more flavor of the, of the team and the, and the family that the city is. Um, and then uh, succession planning has always been a hot topic. We, we, we know that the, age, the workforce is aging and they're going to be what they call the, the silver tsunami. So we know there's going to be uh, significant amounts of re retirements um, in the next uh, five to 10 years. And so we want to make sure that our employees are um, trained and cross-trained enough so that we can promote within um, if we can. And then lastly, um, for, for risk, and again, this is a, a part of the HR, the, the risk and, and HR are, are blended, um, but the city is a member of, of the California uh, Joint Powers, I don't know what the A stands for, authority. No, the, Think of that insurance, in, insurance, insurance. Yeah, thank you. Insurance authority. Um, and so the, the, the authority has a, about 116 California public agencies uh, throughout. So uh, what that allows us to do is, you know, pay premiums. We're, we're, we're pulling our risk together um, in order to kind of help keep costs down from from year to year. Um, those those are the list of coverages that we currently offer. Uh, general liability is the big one at 1.2 million. Uh, uh, the workers' compensation uh, program is the next one at uh, just a little under 900,000 and so forth. So um, in, in total, um, our risk for the city um, costs and premiums is uh, in the neighborhood of $1.7 million a year. Um, my total operating budget, not personnel, but just operating costs is 2.8. So 60% so um, of the total budget in the admin services um, is related to, to risk. So uh, that's that's all I had from for my spiel. Um, happy to answer any questions, that, or like I said, um, we could dive in in much further detail on the financial reports um, uh, later date. No, I don't have any questions. Thank you. Sarah, are you muted? That would help. Thanks, Dave. I was telling you how quick I was going to be, and then I wasted time. Um, so again, I'm Sarah Johnson-Rios. Um, I was thanking you for your attention. 
and your great questions. And I've just got three quick slides for you about what the city manager's office does. So the city manager's office is really the executive office um, for city operations. And Tom talked about the council manager form of government. So he is the day-to-day -day CEO of the city responsible for coordinating the implementation of the city council's policy directions. And so uh, we do that by organizing and coordinating resources to be as efficient um, and responsive as possible. We also strive to foster community trust and pride in local government by providing um, excellent customer service. And so uh, our staff answers the main phone lines and um, main email uh, account and, and responds to a lot of um, public inquiries. So um, a little bit more detail about how we're set up. Next slide, please. Um, we have 10 staff members and um, so it's Tom and then myself. Um, I'm responsible for helping support Tom and his uh, oversight of all of the operating departments. And then I also oversee the operations of the city manager's office um, department itself. Next slide, please. Sarah, you might share a little bit about your background if you don't mind. Oh yeah, thanks. Um, so I am a relative newcomer to the city of Paso. I got here just over a year ago and I'm one of those um, Southern California folks who came here as a visitor and thought it was a charming, lovely town. Um, and so when this opportunity came available, I was thrilled to be able to take it. And um, I do have a background in city administration, primarily in Southern California. So um, uh, yeah. Nice to virtually meet you. Um, and let's see, I wanted to talk a little bit briefly about what our five um, divisions do within the city manager's office. And divisions is sort of a misnomer in this case because most of them are, are one person. Um, administration is Tom and I. And so in addition to providing oversight for the other operating departments, we do a lot of work on um, interdepartmental projects, on key special projects, and then we're also coordinating regularly with community stakeholders and stakeholder groups such as the Chamber of Commerce, Travel Paso, the Wine Country Alliance, Downtown Main Street, um, the school district, Cuesta College, etc. So um, those are some of our roles. And then IT is the largest actual uh, division in the city manager's office. The IT manager is Dave McHugh, who's running the presentation. Thanks, Dave. And he has a team of um, five, including him, that oversee all of the city's IT needs. Um, there's some of the stats there for you, $1.3 million in equipment. I think the number of devices is around 270, maybe more now. And really what I wanted to highlight about their team is how they've been really integral since March and in helping maintain city operations largely virtually. And so uh, they have gotten all of our virtual meetings up and running. They've gotten um, roughly a third of our FTEs uh, the ability to work remotely. Um, a lot of our staff is still working in the field, um, but those staff that, that have the ability to, to work remotely um, are doing that in some cases, in, in cases where that's possible to comply with public health guidelines. So, so Dave and his staff have been tremendously responsive. They provide great customer service. Um, and they recently, he recently oversaw a city website update. Um, and we've seen a lot more traffic since the pandemic as well. So really providing that service to the community. Economic development um, has long been a priority of city council. Council recently approved a, an economic development manager position. Um, and so we, do, we did have an economic development manager start with the city just a couple of months ago. So we're really excited to have that resource that's not being funded by the general fund. It's being funded um, through SB 1090 funds associated with the decommissioning of Diablo um, Canyon. And so um, the goals there are, are numerous. Right now we're focused on pandemic recovery in the near term. And then long term, we're really uh, striving to diversify Paso's economy, to attract higher wage jobs, um, and currently really to support businesses who are here, but also to keep an eye uh, out for business attraction um, during the pandemic recovery. 
The city clerk um, is a role that's also undergoing some changes. Uh, as Tom mentioned, it was an elected city clerk and um, that changed uh, with the last election. So um, we had a deputy city clerk employed full time in the city manager's office who was doing a lot of the day to day responsibilities. That's Melissa Martin. And you've heard her on city council meetings recently. She's now acting as the acting city clerk. And so she's responsible for uh, preparing uh, the agenda packets, public noticing, um, providing election support. I believe you, you, uh, all of all of the candidates met with her in, in, in terms of um, getting her paperwork filed. And she's also responsible for um, a lot of our record keeping and our Public Record Act request tracking and response. And then finally, civic engagement. Um, that is also a one person team. Uh, Shauna Howenstein is our civic engagement coordinator. And so she's the person behind um, our city newsletter that goes out every couple of weeks, the city's social media presence. Um, and she's really responsible for a lot of the customer service and, and responding to questions that come in. So um, I think that sums up the city manager's office. And we'll go to the last, we'll leave it on the last slide for questions. One thing I did want to mention before turning it over is if we do have any members of the public that are watching on YouTube, and if you have any questions, you can you can uh, follow up with the city uh, by emailing info at prcity.com or by calling 805-227-PASO, which is 805-227-7276. So thank you again for your attention. And at this point, we can open it up to any questions for, for me or for the rest of the team. No, no more questions, huh? Well, I'm looking at my notes, and I think uh, all the questions I did jot down were answered. So no, I, I believe that everything I was curious about has been answered. Thank you. Great, and I think we wanted to, uh, if we didn't explicitly state it earlier, invite any of the candidates to follow up with um, any department directors to set up a tour of any of the facilities. We'll, we'll do our best to do that in a socially distant, compliant way, um, but still give you the opportunity to see some of the city facilities um, as we would typically do. Or yeah. if there's anything you've heard tonight that you have more detailed questions or just wanna follow up and and really meet with Christopher on our SCADA system and get down and dirty on that, whatever the case may be. Absolutely available for all of that. Yeah, my intention was, uh, it sounded like there was gonna be some document that was circulated after afterwards that has all the uh, contact details. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Yeah, I think, uh, I think I, what I'll do is I'll uh, contact afterwards. I know it's getting late and this is the night after <laughs> uh, a, a meeting, so I don't wanna keep everyone up if it's not necessary. Not a problem. We really appreciate all four of you putting yourselves out in front to run for public office. It's a, often a thankful, thankless task, but we're very thankful that you're willing to do that and serve your community. Uh, we all, all, all of us in the city take great pride in doing as the FIPA go talked about trying to leave the city greater and better than it was entrusted to us. And we know each of you as elected officials and candidates seek to do that as well. So it, it, it doesn't happen by accident and it only happens with people who are community spirited and have a sense of giving back. So thank all four of you for doing so. Unless there are any other questions tonight, we would just like to thank you for putting up with us. And you can tell from how long the presentations went, how much pride each of the department heads takes in their operations and, and the quality of people they have and the quality of services they offer. And we look forward to serving all of you, both in your roles as well as because you're residents of our community going forward. Hi, Tom. Yes, sir. I'd like to shout, do a shout out to Shauna and Melissa for helping answer all the hundreds of emails for last night's meeting. <laughs> That was and, and they're still coming in. Okay. So. Thank you for the presentation. And that's a ditto for me.
All right. Yes. Thank you all very much. This has been very informative. I really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Have a good night. Good night. Good night.